How's everyone doing? So, Strength Chat episode 55, and today I have got a very special guest for you. I am joined by coach, powerlifter, bodybuilder, strongman, MMA fighter. I think he's played football. He's also the head SNC coach at American Top Team. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a, another endless list of things that he's done. I'm joined by Phil Daru. How are you doing? I'm good, bro. Thanks for having me on. This is uh, it's a pleasure. No worries at all. Um, so what have you been up to? What have you been working on recently? Oh, man, what, I've, what I haven't I've been working on is the question. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, right now I have uh, roughly 52 fighters that are in camp or about to go into camp at American Top Team. I do have three Olympic judo uh, practitioners that I'm working with at the moment. I also have my online programming that's going on right now. I have a couple of programs that are in the works that are actually going to open up soon. Um, you know, just, just, you know, everyday grind. Also, I have my own private gyms up here about 90 minutes away from American Top Team. So, I have those that I have to work with. And, you know, then I'm a full-time family man. So, I'm working with that as well. So, there's a lot going on. But as long as I have a, a good, solid schedule, I'm good to go. Yeah, and uh, enough to, enough stuff to keep you out of trouble then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, so for all those listening who might not, obviously, I've mentioned quite a, a long list um, of types of training that you you've done before and competed in. And um, for anyone who doesn't know your background, do you just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I played college football. It's American football for you guys. Uh, played college football. I was a uh, introduced to mixed martial arts after I was done playing football. I've done martial arts as a kid since I was about four years old. I did Kempo Karate, uh, but MMA was beginning to be very popular. And uh, after college, we ended up, my family ended up moving up, up to about 90 minutes north of Coconut Creek, where the original ATT is. Okay. And uh, I got introduced to a man named Dean Thomas, who is a uh, Pretty well known nowadays. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, so I started with Dean at around 2011, 2012. I started uh, competing and fighting amateur. It was just training there. As I was doing that, um, I was getting my, uh, I was finishing up my undergrad and I also got a couple of certifications there. So I was doing just basic personal training on the side and then also training my teammates that I trained with that American top team, at the American top team that Dean had. And uh, from there, around uh, the age of 22, I ended up opening up my own facility just because I just got tired of paying rent and sneaking people into Gold's Gym. So ended up opening up my own facility, training just general pop for a long time and then working with some uh, local high school athletes and, and also my, my teammates as well. Um, by the time I was about 26, I ended up retiring from the sport of MMA as a professional. Along that time, I did some bodybuilding. I did some powerlifting. I still do powerlifting. I actually have a meet coming up soon. I did some strongman. Pretty much everything in, in the strength world I've probably done. Um, and then I finally got the job, the head job at American Top Team Coconut Creek by the age of 27. So that's about four years now that were going on that I was there full time as a, as a head coach or as a, as a coach there. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, just been working there ever since. Along that path, I've, I've gotten awards for the best strength and conditioning coach of the year for the Florida MMA Awards. I've gotten nominated for the World MMA Awards as a trainer of the year. Hopefully we'll get nominated and win this one uh, this year. Last year was a big year for me. I did seven countries uh, for seminars there. So I, wow. I made my way all the way out to Australia and Singapore and the 30-hour flights was pretty crazy for me but it was a good way for me to spread my knowledge with other individuals that are like-minded that wanted to learn and grow yeah. and in the sport of, uh, of combat sports in general there's just a big misconception of what you need to do um, from a from a game plan from a periodization perspective from a programming perspective yeah. and then an exercise selection and then also just understanding the proper means to progress them and yeah. not just kind of doing circuits all day long and and just trying to kill them, you know, as far as maximally training and yeah. not understanding a full purpose of how to actually train. So yeah. that's, that's what I've been doing so far. 
and uh, we're going to keep this thing rolling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that what you're aiming to do then do uh, do more seminars in in the future because i know you're always posting that you 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 know all over doing doing seminars is that a route that you want to go down yeah i think that you know doing the seminars helps me reach a wider audience yeah you know, i also have my own podcast fight strength podcast that i actually help uh you know get my get my knowledge out there hold on one second i got somebody rolling he's rolling a garbage can hold on <laughs> uh, I'm I'm in the back of my gym, guys. If you don't see, I'm I'm over here. It's just <laughs> just so so the viewers and the listeners know what's going on. <laughs> for, uh, for those listening yeah, on so, Spotify, you might not see, but for those on YouTube, there you go. You've got a you've got an intro into the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, basically, yeah, it's what I wanted to do when I started this thing. I wanted to make sure that I, I was able to, you know, get out there and, and spread my knowledge to everybody worldwide. And yeah. it just so happened that I had the opportunity last year to really start it up. And I started in Russia and then going all the way around the world, did seven countries, which was awesome for me. And it was something that, you know, I, I thought I was going to do. I didn't think I was going to do as fast, um, but it just blew up and, you know, opportunities came. So I had to take it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Has that affected the um, amount of clients that, and athletes that you coach or are you still doing the same amount of coaching? No, I actually have a good amount of assistants and interns that actually help me out when I leave American Top Team to do these right. seminars. So I, I set the systems in place so that they understand what they need to do on a, on a daily basis. And then they, they're trained enough to understand all the regulation and then putting things in proper place from, from a subjective perspective so that, you know, when we can get into detail on, on programming, but, you know, primarily it's, it's, it's a broad system, but the – the execution of that system is subjective towards the individual. Yeah. Okay. So they understand that process. And also I've been more selective with my, just with my clients in general. I don't train a lot of personal training. I don't do that too much anymore. Um, but yeah, so I, I just really train my fighters and, and work on the work on my online programming, which is yeah. something that's uh, been able to, you know, hit around the world as well. So yeah. I'm good with that. Ah, cool. Um, so you touched on obviously um, from finishing fighting, doing quite a lot of um, different strength sports. Was that just because you fancied giving it a, giving it a go? Was it to replace um, competing in um, fighting? Why, how did that come about? Sort of getting involved in bodybuilding and strongman. Yeah. So I mean, all my life I've competed. You know, uh, either it was competing in martial arts, competing in any type of ball sport that I've played in. Um, so I, I just had a void that I needed to fill, especially when I was not fighting anymore. Um, and then I had to go to the most dangerous thing I could possibly do, which was probably strong men and powerlifting to get on the heavy loads that could possibly damage me. And that's just the only way I'm going to get out of bed. You know what <laughs> I mean? So uh, for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really dopamine dominant. So I need that. I need that rush of, of, of fear almost to, yeah. uh, to get me training, to get, you know, to keep me going. And then also, it helps me as a coach to understand certain type of parameters and, and strength adaptations per, you know, per type of, of sport, whether it be bodybuilding, whether it be powerlifting. And I can take these things from each individual sport and then put them into my own practice as a coach for combat sports. Yeah. That, that's led quite nicely into the, into the next thing I was going to ask, really. As a, as a coach... Um, learning all these different techniques, have you found that um, one uh, one strength such as like strongman training has crossed over to other things, or have you picked and picked and choose which ones cross over? What, how has that worked? Well, I mean, a lot of it's subjective towards the individual. So after we get the assessment, I can truly understand what they need. But you know, from a from a base perspective of compound lifts, I think nothing beats a, a basic squat, a basic deadlift and some type of pressing movement. So when that, in that perspective, powerlifting does have high transferability to what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but there's other ways to do that. You don't just have to do a bilateral back squat. You don't just have to do a conventional deadlift and you don't just have to do a bench press. But those variations can be altered depending on the individual and their weaknesses. So yeah. for that, I do use um, strongman from a conditioning standpoint, I believe. And, and when we're talking about functional training everybody throws around this word a lot it's functional per what sport you're actually trying to play or do 
Yeah. And I do believe that strongman has high correlation over to the sport of combat sports from a training perspective, from the conditioning aspect, and from the odd objects that you have to utilize and the multi-directional patterns that you move in do highly transfer over to the sport of MMA. Yeah. And combat sports in general. Yeah. I think when I think when it comes to strongman people sometimes um misunderstand it's not powerlifting is where you know you try and lift as, as maximal as you can. But when you look at some of the strongman events, it's for time or for reps and like you say, carrying um awkward objects. Um I know for my, for myself, um for uh, some of the clients that I train, um adding in some strongman complexes or medleys, one it adds a little bit of variation and it's fun. Um, and it's training quite a lot of different movement patterns, like you've said, rather than you know just doing just doing a normal a normal back squat. Um, yeah, I think I think that I think that you know just making sure as a coach too with me, my guys, the the reason why they're in they're in MMA is because they like variation, right? Yeah. They wouldn't be doing kickboxing, boxing, jujitsu, wrestling if they didn't enjoy variation. And yeah. we don't want things to get stale, especially from a physical preparation standpoint, because a lot of these guys don't want to be in the weight room anyways. So I have to make sure that they like what they're doing and it's exciting yeah. as opposed to doing the same and not this thing over and over and over again. Yes, we're going to do things that so we can cause long term adaptation, but we also want to make sure we're constantly varying so we can eliminate the law of accommodation. Yeah, I, th I think as well for that, you know, it's a, a, a great point because obviously the level of athletes that you'll be training with, they, they know they have to get the gym done, but I'm sure they'd much rather be in the ring doing, working on their, on their, working on their actual skills than the time they're spending in the gym. Yeah, I mean, that's where they make their money, right? And that's why they made it to the level that they're at. I mean, I used to have to constantly vary the modalities, the exercises primarily for Dustin Poirier because all he really wanted to do was punch people in the face all day, <laughs> you know? So I, I had to make sure that he was constantly stimulated and, and excited to come train. And now he loves to weight train. He loves to come yeah. in the gym, get stronger, get faster, get more powerful, see these changes, you know, increase his uh, aerobic power and increase his overall capacity to do work. Yeah. And when he's see, seen those changes, that's when you get more buy-in to the situation. But, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the times these guys, like I said, never really step foot in the weight room whatsoever. Yeah. Um, they're very novice and beginner-like when it comes down to weight training, when it comes down to exercises under load. And uh, so that's something that we have to make sure that we're doing as, as coaches is to reiterate and make sure that they understand proper movement patterns and then give them the prerequisites to get under heavy load so that they don't hurt themselves. Yeah. So sort of with the different um, training variables and the different types of training, how has um, from competing yourself in the, in the different strength sports and coaching other people as well, how has your mindset changed? Or I know obviously you mentioned that, you know, you need competition, but has your mindset changed um, from competing in the different different sports or has it is it quite similar across all, across the board? I mean, I think that competing in powerlifting taught me how to execute lifts more properly when it comes down to mechanical advantages. Yeah. Uh, strongman's taught me how to use leverages a lot more efficiently, how to use my conditioning a lot more efficiently under load. Uh, when it comes down to fighting, that's just understanding how to reduce my stress in a stressful state, right? So oh, okay. whether I'm in a, in a training room where I'm, I'm at, I have to spar multiple killers throughout the day, I'm managing my stress by understanding how to calm myself down and worry about my technical and tactical ways so that I can be efficient in my energy systems. Yeah. So that was one way of doing it. And as far as bodybuilding goes, you know, I think just understanding how to move my move weight with my muscle, right? Yeah. How to properly contract each muscle fiber so that we can gain proper hypertrophy, but also the neuromuscular capacity to move weight efficiently and then build hypertrophy on the muscles needed to um, increase force production in main lifts. 
Yeah. So would you recommend for people to learn all these different elements that, you, that you've said? Would you recommend people to you know, vary the type of training that they're doing and not just stick? Because, for example, powerlifting, obviously it's the same movements, same movements all the time. You don't really get exposure to um, any, anything else. Would you recommend people to um, do a various, very, variation of training? Yeah, I, you know, I never lived in absolutes, and I, and I do believe that you know, if, if you are one track minded, you're you're going to, you know, keep yourself from evolving. So, yeah. at the end of the day, you need to be able to take every individual aspect and put it in the right place at the right time. It all comes from context. So, if I can understand a certain circumstance or a situation, I can take those certain modalities or those exercises or that type of training that we would do and fit the circumstances needed so that we can get a, a positive adaptation with that. The problem is a lot of people are one track minded, stay in their own little world or realm and don't venture out to other aspects of training. There's so yeah. many different things you could take from every different way of training yoga, yeah. you know, um, fucking Pilates, man. I don't, yeah. it doesn't matter what <laughs> it is, bro. you know, I'm not saying, you know, but at the end of the day, there's things you could take from everything. And yeah. the only way to do that is to put yourself in position to understand how that feels. Yeah. And then you can go ahead and relay that over to your athletes. Yeah. And I suppose as well, it adds in a little bit of um, robustness and injury prevention rather than just doing the same, same thing over and over again. Because as soon as you do, might do something else, you know, in everyday life, there's different movements. You might end up in, injuring yourself from there. Yep, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that and that comes into play with the mobility aspect of things and and understanding how to actually move as a true as a true human um, and gaining the prerequisites, like I said before, to get underneath heavy load and to produce force in really unconventional uh, positions like we do in MMA. Yeah. So le leading on to the next bit, which uh, the, the next sort of question I had, I had lined up, which is movement and mobility. So obviously you've, you've posted quite, quite a lot about that. Now, mm -hmm. you would think that... Um, uh, fighters would already have good mobility because there's obviously the different different positions that they're getting in, especially especially in MMA. But why do you work so much uh, on mobility with with athletes, and why why is it so important? Well, at the end of the day, a lot of these guys and girls have been fighting for a long time, and they've been stuck in fixed positions. Um, and with athletes in general, they're master compensators, right? So if one thing does not work, they're going to compensate to move another so that it still can get an outcome, right? Your muscles or your body can still prevent or, you know, produce an outcome. Yeah. The problem with that is at the end of the day, you're not stimulating or you're not producing force from certain muscles. And if you're not putting, if you're not activating those mechanoreceptors in those ranges, they're going to ultimately get injured at one point in time. So what we're trying to do with mobility work from a movement perspective is gain that optimal range of control of the body so that they can produce force in those end ranges. Um, what I've seen fighting myself and then working with these athletes forever now, you know, roughly a decade, um, is that kyphotic posture is very huge, you know, um, anterior pelvic tilt. You know, they also have less in dorsiflexion flexion just from the years and years of kicking. Yeah. You end up getting scar tissue there and fractures that limit that, that range of motion in the ankle, knee rotation, things like that. So if you can't optimize that mobility and the stability in each joint, then you're not going to be able to optimally move to produce force when you're trying to train that aspect, right? So for me, Mobility is a key factor when it comes down to physical preparation, especially if you're trying to get an athlete stronger, more powerful, and then also faster when it comes down to change of direction and quickness. Because if they can't, they can't produce force in a certain uh, movement or in a certain position, then it's, it's useless in my opinion, right? Yeah. Flexibility can only go so far. It's nothing for me to get into. I can push myself into a squat when I have the floor and gravity pushing me down, but can I bring my leg up opt or with an action-based approach using my muscle to do the movement? If I yeah. cannot do that, if I get forced in that position on the mats, I'm going to be stuck there. And if I'm yeah. stuck and pinned, then I have no way of getting out of a position 
which will ultimately lead to me either getting pounded out through ground and pound or getting submitted. Yeah. So would there be ever, obviously, you know, there, it's specific to that, to that spot. Is there ever, ever a time where, um, depending on their uh, mobility level, that you wouldn't change anything or, or work on anything? Or is it a case of, right, everyone, need, everyone, needs, to, everyone needs to move well? So, for example, um, I've, got a, I've got a guy, um, he's actually one of, my, one of my closest friends, really. He's a basketballer and he always walks on his, walks on his tiptoes and he's quite, he's quite springy. But we've tried, tried to stretch out his calves and it's sort of, it's affected his performance, performance a little bit. So would you ever, is there ever a point where you would work on other areas and not work on um, something that might help them? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about flexibility over active mobility. Okay. When I'm talking active mobility, we're kind of playing around with reciprocal inhibition in a way, even though that has truly been debunked in a lot of ways just from the simple fact that just because you put an antagonistic on contraction doesn't necessarily mean the opposite muscle is going to relax. It's just showing that it is going to stretch. So what we're trying to accomplish with, with the mobility work is gaining active control and not, not creating lax laxity inside the tissue. If that makes any sense. Right. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not trying to stretch in a static stretch of calf muscle to, reduce force production Mm -hmm. what i will do is increase dorsiflexion through my anterior tibialis to maybe put the gastric on stretch but not to the point of where i'm passively stretching it and putting in like i said uh, reducing force production i'm actually increasing that strength in the antagonistic muscle Uh, okay so obviously chatting there about um mobility produce uh, force and making sure that they have um, adequate mobility mm-hmm. yeah. what, would, what would be the what would be the case if someone um was hypermobile or had a little bit too much mobility so how would how would that affect um how would that affect training just shorten everything down well then we would have to figure out exactly what they are lacking as far as from a stability standpoint right right so if you have a guy that, that can seriously move efficiently. Now we have to see, okay, how well, how well can they use that mobility under load, right? So now can they produce force with that mobility that they have? Yeah. And if they can produce force with it, then we're fine. We don't leave, we leave it alone, right? Now, from that perspective, you have the range of motion. Let's say they do have mobility, but no strength. Now you have the range of motion to actually get that person stronger. Yes. So then you start working on proximal stability. You work on intra-abdominal pressure. You work on irradiation tactics so that they can stay um, stiffened in the right joints and mobile in the other joints. So you work through that joint-by-joint approach. Yeah. 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 I sort of try to get both ends of there of people with lack of mobility and, and, and lots of mobility. Because sometimes you see that, um, you know, some people are walking and um, they, can, they can move really, really well, but they're just, they're just all over the place. And then other people can have, they've got a little bit of movement, but can't, they can't generate enough force. You know, they look like big, big guys, but it's yeah. like, you know, you should, be, you, should be throwing, you should be throwing yourself around a little bit more with a little bit more force and a little bit more power. So yeah. is that... Is there, is there any key areas that um, are common areas that you've seen people having to work on in terms of, in terms of more mobility and, and, and control? Um, to work on their mobility, to enhance it? Yeah. I mean, hips are always a big deal for us when it comes down to combat sports, um, especially the asymmetries between internal and external rotation of the hip um, just because of the stance. Yeah. Uh, usually the lead foot has more – of external rotation as opposed to internal rotation. And then the back foot usually has more or external rotation as opposed to internal rotation. And uh, it really depends on the person too, right? So, Mm -hmm. and if you are a jiu-jitsu practitioner, you can actually see where they like to pass and where they like to hook, right? Right. So where they like to throw their hooks in and where they like to pass, usually you can see where their external and internal rotation lies. So yeah. those are types of things that I do see from an asymmetry standpoint. Um, and then shoulder mobility is a huge thing. Um, these guys and girls are so anterior dominant because they've thrown millions and millions of punches throughout the days and throughout the weeks and years 
So they end up getting that kyphotic posture. So there's a lack of mobility in the scat that we have to actually gain new range of motion. So we work on things like controlled articular rotations, pales and rails in external internal rotation. A lot of it comes from external rotation. There's a limit of external rotation because of that kyphotic rolled forward posture. So yeah. we want to increase that range of motion in the anterior delt pec minor and work on the, the you know, the uh, rhomboids, work on the rear delts, work on the lats, work on the muscles of the scap so that we can actually pull that back and work on a, an optimal posture to produce force and then also to reduce the risk of uh, non-contact injuries. Yeah. So would that be through the, the movement prep at the start of the session or would you be looking to do that through actual exercises so that's both, right? So yeah. the, in the beginning, we do an initial assessment. We do what's called a functional range assessment, and that's derived from functional range systems. And uh, Dr. Spina is a guy that I hold in high regard. Um, functional range conditioning is what I first started with, and then I, I you know, decided to get more and more in detail with his, uh, with his approach and his principles. But, you know, basically what you do is we're working to see compensation patterns through articulations of each joint capsule. So yeah. I'll go ahead and I'll do what's called controlled articular rotations or what we call cars. And uh, you can see through those rotations where they compensate from. And then from that point, you get that, you get that range stronger through means of isometrics and end range holds and hovers so that they can gain the prerequisites in that position to be stronger. Now, when you're talking about exercise selection, you know, obviously if they can't do it without load, we're not going to load that position. Yes. So there's ways to progress that once they gain that, you know, that optimal range uh, or control in the range, then we start to slowly progress with weight, whether that be a five pound or 10 pound ankle weight, whether that be, you know, a 15 pound dumbbell all the way up to a heavy barbell. But like I said, if they can't optimally pull their head or pull their arm up over their head without breaking into TL junction or along the lines of that, then I'm not going to go ahead and load them with a military press. It's just not yeah. going to happen, right? Yeah. So you can see that through, you know, if you wanted to do a functional movement screen or anything like that, by all means, I have no problems with that. I have my own assessment protocol that I use. I actually have it on my YouTube channel. You can check it out. Um, but basically what you would do is a form of FMS because what I've seen is that, you know, primarily I know when they come in where they're going to be deficient, where they're going to have dysfunction because I've seen it. Yeah. And there's a common occurrence and a common theme with fighters. So sometimes I don't even waste my time with an overhead squat because I know they can't do it. You know yeah. what I mean? So at the end of the day, I may regress that overhead squat and we, we may just do a regular uh, you know, bilateral body weight squat just to see where the mobility lies or where it lacks. And then from there, I'll, I'll put together uh, mobility uh, protocol and some homework to do outside of that. And then from there, I go ahead and give them or prescribe the most efficient and effective exercise so that they can still progress from a strength adaptation standpoint, but not put them in a bad position to where they're going to get injured. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about the about the FMS. That's the that's the system that we use at the gym that, that I work at. And um, yeah, I, I compete in, in powerlifting myself. So for my for my overhead squat, I, I don't really do over overhead pressing. I won't squat my arms above my head. And it's yeah. interesting as well that there was a um, there was a couple of kickboxes that came in. And yeah. you know when you mentioned there about the stance, the the hurdle step. One leg is like is, is pretty good, and the other leg just yeah. It's interesting to see to see that. That was probably and honestly, that was probably their back foot that that was really stable and strong. Yeah, because they're pushing lateral off of that yeah. foot, and they're primarily pushing off of that foot mostly, um, especially if they're more of a kickboxer because they're coming forward, right? And mm -hmm. if you're a traditional kickboxer or a Muay Thai guy. Um, a lot of your weight is going to be on that back foot where the front foot is kind of out there to move. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's, it's definitely funny to see, especially when you're looking at sporting backgrounds like BJJ and wrestling. I could, I could tell a wrestler, not just from the ears, but from their <laughs> posture when they walk yeah. in the gym. You could just tell, you know, they're, they're just knuckle draggers, you know what I mean? Um, 
have very poor supination. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I can kind of see it from there, from just their background of, of yeah. sport, you know, and then I'll go into the assessment, the movement assessment, and kind of correlate what we need to do from an exercise selection standpoint yeah. going further. Yeah, from the, from the content you've put out there about, um, about mobility and the, the more FMSs and assessments I've done, you sort of, especially if, especially if people are, are, playing, are playing sports and they come in, and if they are playing combat sports, yeah, you sort of, yeah, look and think. Oh, okay, so which 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 one are, which one are you are? Yeah, that that seems to that seems to ring a bell. Um, and as well, you know, with um, with powerlifters, with powerlifters as well. As soon as as soon as you know, guys or girls walk in, it's like ah, okay. And then before they've even done the test, sometimes you can you can find out from there. Yeah. Um, so for do you have any? Um, obviously, you've mentioned about prescribing exercises. Do you have any um, go tos that have worked really well to to help with mobility? Yeah, man. Um, as far as exercises go, you know, from in the weight room, you know, I've always seen that the Zercher squat has been something of mine. And people are kind of dubbing me the Zercher squat guy <laughs> uh, because honestly, it's the most efficient lift for me. You know, it puts the it puts the barbell in the right position to where they can properly hip hinge. They have a counterbalance in that perspective of the bar path. You know, um, from a from a transferability standpoint, the bar is sitting on the crooks of the elbow. So it's kind of like a double underhooks position. And they're utilizing all the muscles needed to produce force inside the cage, right? They're working their core, they're working their, their, their whole posterior chain, their hips, their quads. You know, like I said, their core is engaged. And then I split the hands apart so that you can get more upper body muscle activation that way. Um, so they're getting a full body lift with that. And then we're not truly axial loading the spine. So now, you know, they're able to get a squat pattern down. It's efficient and it's effective. So that's why I usually use it. And, and a lot of, and trust me, I played around with back squats. I played around with front squats. And it's just I, with 50 fighters, 50 plus fighters, every hour on the hour, I have to go with the most easily accessible exercise that is going to give me the biggest bang for my buck. And that's how, you know, that's what it is. Yes. So. Don't, I'm, not saying that Zerch, I'm not saying that front squats and, and, and back squats are bad, and I'm not saying that Zercher squat is the end-all, be-all, but I am saying that I've seen tremendous increases in overall strength progressions, especially with, from the lower body, but also from upper body isometric strength. And then also, it's just a very efficient lift because I've never seen anybody – I've never seen it look bad. In, in, yeah. in all my times of being it, and I can throw up the same person underneath a back squat and the shit looked terrible. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It looked, it's disgusting. Um, and it's just because of the bar path. It's just because they lack the mobility. They lack the external rotation in the shoulder. So things start to compensate. So they start to compensate to move the weight. And when they compensate, shit starts to look really bad really, really quickly. Yeah. You know, so it just eliminates that compensation. And, uh, and then from there, as far as like correctives go, you know, I've always enjoyed the wall slides or they call them wall angels for the yeah, shoulder. Yeah. I've seen that that's been helping. You know, obviously you have to train it. We're not talking about short term stimulus, we're talking long term adaptation. Mm -hmm. So you constantly do that. And yes, I've, and it's, it's a very simple movement, but it has helped a lot. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, from a, from a hip perspective, I do a thing called, um, I do a hip series where I'll do a cook bridge or basically a single leg glute bridge. Then I'll go into what I call a single leg glute bridge leg whip. Um, and, and I've rarely seen this done. I, I, I just came, I came together with it. I probably maybe, maybe about four, four or six, maybe six months ago where I was like, man, I need to, I want to increase stability of the glute. Right, and I want to increase contralateral stability, but I also need to work on their adductor strength yeah. and mobility. So I was like, "How can I do this all in one?" Because I got to get this shit done, right? So I can't spend all day in the warm up, even though the warm up is very, very important for me. So I was like, "Let me put it this all together." And I'm just sitting there. So I was like, "Man, maybe if we did like an abduction with hip extension, yeah, and see if we can fire the glute effectively on the on the contralateral side, and." you know, lo and behold, it actually worked and they felt a good difference in it. So 
And then another thing that it helps is it shows me how strong their obliques are. So yeah. when they start to abduct in that extension, right, I'm going to see if that hip drops. And if that hip drops, I know that they have limited uh, oblique activation in that, in, that, yeah. in that side. So that's another way that I use an indication of where they're strong at, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a good way also, like I said, to improve hip mobility um, from an abduction standpoint. Now, I use a lot of functional range conditioning, like I said in the past. So controlled articular rotations have been a key factor when it comes down to gaining mobility and optimal control in any end range, whether it be internal, external, right? Um, abduction, adduction, whatever the case is. When the hip can move like a true hip, yeah, you're increasing movement quality and they're increasing force production from any movement that you do, whether, you know, in the gym. So in the gym or in the cage. So that's why I like to utilize that. Um, band steps, uh, I usually use um, either hip circle or just like a perform better band. Yeah. Doing those side steps have helped a lot when it comes down to hip and glute activation and strength in the uh, in abduction. Um, it's improved from a from a tactile cueing perspective. It's improved the ability to uh, eliminate the uh, the valgus of the knees. So I'll throw that hip circle on in between a couple of workout or workup sets in their zercher squat, yeah. and it usually fixes valgus really quickly. Yeah. So I actually can show and teach, you know, hip torque and proper external rotation with the band. So that's yeah. another corrective that we utilize. Um, when it comes to, let's say, when it comes to uh, T-spine mobility, same thing. I also like prone swimmers. I think that that does help, especially if you do it in the right way. Yeah. Um, you know. Obviously, you want to make sure that they're not breaking in their lumbar. That's one thing that I've seen that people do that is an issue is mm -hmm. you don't want to try to gain range that's not really there, right? Mm -hmm. Faulty range is worse than anything. So you want to make sure that they're maintaining a neutral lumbar spine, you know, create intra-abdominal pressure as they're rotating through their thoracic. Yes. So you want to make sure that you're disassociating lumbar from thoracic. Yeah, so it's a great point when you're saying about um, you don't want movement, you know, s somewhere else. Because especially when it comes to mobility exercises, you'll find you you or I've demonstrated the exercise to to some people, and then you'll walk away and look back, and something's moving that shouldn't be shouldn't be moving, and it's a little bit. We'll stick with it, get as much range of movement as you can in that, and then gradually gradually build it up. Um, are those exercises used across the board and then um, you would then put more individual exercises depending on the person? Yeah, so uh, there's testers and there's builders, right? So the testers are primarily going to be my compound lifts. I choose about four to five compound lifts and those are consisting of zercher squats, floor press, zercher, or zercher squat, floor press, uh, trap bar deadlift, a sumo deadlift, and then uh, an incline or a close grip bench press. So I'll use those as my testers, and then whatever I see go wrong from a movement perspective, then I obviously hit the muscles needed in my accessories or, or my correctors, it's especially when it comes down to pro producing force in a range that I see that they're not capable of doing so. So if they're coming out of the squat and usually, you know, their back is rounding, then obviously we need some upper back strength. We need some core strength, things like that. Um, in the sumo, you know, if they're just lacking the ability to break it off the floor, usually that's a hip and hamstring problem. You know, so we want to make sure that we're hitting that on our accessories. We do a lot of GHR work, um, a lot of good mornings, a lot of hamstring curls with the bow slides or bands. Uh, when it comes down to upper back, we do a lot of face pulls, um, a lot of uh, banded, banded pull-aparts, things like that. And we'll do that with high, high repetitions, especially for joint restoration. And, and getting blood inside the tissue so that we can recover properly, but also, you know, get that, get that uh, uh, proper movement mechanics when it comes down to activating the muscle when it needs to in the main lifts. Yeah. So when you chat there about actually um, creating force, which is the, um, the, the next topic that I wanted to chat about really, and we mentioned about um, obviously these guys and girls wanting to produce force within a, within a, combat, a combat environment, with all those exercises, do you work on any um, 
sort of more uh, explosive exercises from the exercises you mentioned before about the zercher squat and the the trap bar deadlift, or is is that uh, is that based in their in their actual training? Yeah, so um, you know, with the compound lifts, we do see. I run a conjugate method, so when you're talking about force, right, that's mass times acceleration. So we do work maximal effort on days and we work dynamic effort on days too as well yeah. now i have limited time with my guys and girls so we have to make sure that we're putting in the proper uh you know the proper movement patterns along with the intensities to increase dynamic speed and maximal strength so yeah. for me only because i have them two days a week the uh the program will consist of a lower body strength day, so a lower body max effort day, yeah. followed with an upper body dynamic effort day. Right. So, and then the next day you will do, you just flip flop it, right? Yeah. So with that being said, you're still abiding by that 72 hour rule where we're not, you know, taking a max effort lift and using that as a dynamic lift on the day that's right next to it. So we want to make sure that we're getting recovery there so we can manage fatigue. Yeah. Now, with the lifts, are you saying that I use, do I use the Zercher for a dynamic effort? In yeah, practice? so in terms of to, to produce explosive power, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it all depends on the person. It all depends on how well they can lift, right? How long they've been in the weight room. And if they are efficient in the lift, and usually with the Zercher, that's pretty easily done. Um, but it also depends on how strong they are, right? If they're not too strong, then if I go 50% of their max, really isn't going to be anything. It may be, yeah. you know, 25s on the bar, or in your case, it would probably be uh, roughly like 60 kilos mm. at the most. Yeah. And, you know, if I had bands, I would use 25% band tension, but a lot of times I don't have bands at the gym, you yeah. know, because of the fact that at America Top Team, we don't have the means to do that. Um, yeah. But if I did do anything as far as explosive work, it's more primarily centered around box jumps, any type of jumping pattern, and any throws, med ball throws and tosses. Yeah. And that's how I usually work on the explosive speed and power um, for that perspective. Why I asked that is that it actually came up in a topic with um, with a guy that I work with called Matt Cook, um, and he works. He does uh, a lot of the lot of the sports performance um, at, the, at the gym that I work out. With, and we were chatting okay. about sort of Olympic lifts, um, working with quite a lot of varying 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 uh, varying athletes, and yeah. the the benefit of it because they're so technical. It was interesting that you're saying you know using jumps, you're using slams instead of using necessarily the the sort of weightlifting style lifts yeah so you have to think about it from from a speed perspective too right and then a technical aspect is that like that's another sport in itself right so i found that olympic lifting is highly technical right these guys and girls that that compete on that level have been doing it for years and years and years yeah. right it's not as easily done as a regular squat or as easily done as a regular deadlift, right? There's there's three main pulls, right? So you have to make sure, and and you have to make sure one that they have the mobility to do that, mm -hmm. and they have the athleticism to do it. And most of the times they do not. Yeah. And again, I have limited time in the weight room, so I have to make sure that I have the most efficient exercises, the most easily, uh, you know, easily calculated and easily produced. And so that they can get what we need to get done and get up out of there, right? If I'm standing, if I'm staying and I'm, and I'm you know, I'm, I'm making more time to teach a lift, that's taking time away from their skills training. So yeah. it's not optimal, in my opinion, to yeah. spend time on that particular aspect of training yeah. when there's other ways to get the job done when you're talking about an adaptation standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And as well, you know, from a combat side of things, their skill is actually doing their spot. So yeah. adding in, like you're saying, adding, adding, in, adding in something else. Um, so is there any exercises that um, you try and, uh, try and avoid? Because um, obviously you've only got them for, for a certain amount, certain amount of time. Um, so you're trying to do more exercises that give them more bang for their buck. Is there any, um, obviously you've mentioned your go-to exercises, is there anything that you uh, have tried and doesn't work or anything that you just wouldn't, wouldn't do? 
I mean, right now, it just just from the shoulder mobility aspect, is not a lot of overhead stuff that we do, you know, if any. Um, yeah. And honestly, they're not punching overhead. So we are talking about, you know, force production in that certain – it's more horizontal than anything. So yeah. we usually keep it horizontal. Uh, when it comes to, like, pull-ups and chin-ups, I will do that, but I'll make sure, again, that they have the prerequisites to actually get into that overhead position. And they're not torquing the elbow because in time, if they keep doing that and they actually lack that external rotation, they're going to torque the elbow and cause some lateral and medial epicondylitis, which was what we really don't want because that's going to limit their punching output. So I try to stay away from any overhead stuff. Um, Any heavy head, like I'm not a big fan of heavy, like glute bridges or hip bridges or anything like that. I think it distorts the movement pattern, and, and obviously you're going to gain some compensation in that. I do like, obviously, volume glute bridges for the conditioning side of things and then to also get muscle activation and restoration. But other than that, I wouldn't heavily load that. And then anything that's going to be not efficient for that type of individual, right? So if they, you know, if, um, like I said, a back squat, for instance, if they lack the external rotation in the shoulder, if they lack hip and ankle mobility, then obviously that's something that we're not going to do, yeah. you know, and I may even regress it all the way down to a goblet squat if I feel it's necessary. As long yeah. as we're getting what we need and it looks proper, then that's fine. But it's, it's like I said, everything works if put in the right context. So yeah. I hope that makes sense. And yeah, it does. Question. It's one of those things where you always think um, the, the prime example is, is Zercher squats. Um, you know, I've I've done zercher zercher squats myself, and yeah, the actual the actual carry of it does does work work everything, um, and as long as it, it, I'm a big believer, and as long as it meets them meets their goals, right, then they're the exercises that um, that the athletes or the, or the client are going to going to work on. You know, there's no point doing something that isn't going to that has no that has no benefit benefit to them. Um, in terms of the actual level of strength um, that uh, or the weight lifted with the with the athletes that you work with. Is there an expectation, or is there a level, a certain level of strength that you would look for, or is it just that they um, just produce that produce that force and that explosive that explosive power? I mean, we do want them relatively strong for their weight class, correct? Yeah. So because they're fighting guys at their at their size, so it's not like we're working towards getting them world record you know, squat or anything like that. But we do yeah. want to be relatively strong. You know, primarily a lot of, I like to stick when it comes down to a lower body squat movement or, or a deadlift or something along the lines of that. I like to see them hit at least two times their body weight. I think that that's a good indication of, of gaining that relative strength for them. And then it also helps with their conditioning side because it's less intensity that they have to move inside the cage, yeah. right? So if I do have a – if I do bring up my – quote unquote, one rep max, right? Let's say that you started in your uh, a welterweight that you fight at 170, you, you walk around when you start, you walk around at about 185, 190, give or take, and you walk in the cage at 190, your opponent walks in at 190, and your one rep max deadlift is 205, right? That's going to be highly intense for you to actually make something happen and pick that guy up or maneuver him around inside the cage as opposed to if you had a 350 pound max now the intensity is less see so now you have the ability to produce or i should say to uh have to put out less energy to maneuver and to manage the fight properly when it comes down to your opponent so that's why i like to increase maximal strength because energy efficiency becomes that more productive yeah i think uh i I quite like that uh, analogy i'm gonna uh, i might i might use that um Yeah, it, that that summed it up quite well. You, people always think, oh, you know, I don't have to, you know, whether it be boxing or MMA or anything like that. Oh, I'll just, you know, I don't need to be strong. I need to be, I need to be fast or I need to be fit. But it's exactly as you said that, you know, that well, base strength is, needs needs to be there. Dave, like this is the thing, though. That that means that they have, they don't have a good understanding of basic physics, mm-hmm. right? If you're trying to be fast, if you're trying to be more powerful. You have to get stronger, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, if you want to increase explosive power, if you want to increase explosive strength, you have to increase your strength. Yeah. Either way, you know, so 
And at that perspective, you know, there is ways to do it without having to get bigger. I know weight class and, and gaining size is a big, and you know, is a big no-no for a lot of fighters. They think that, oh, you know, if I get bigger, I'm going to grow out the weight class. But in general, we had ran into this situation with Joanna where a lot of the coaches didn't want her to do any weight training because they felt that she was going to gain too much muscle and grow out of the 115 weight class. Now, I work with George Lockhart, who was a weight cut guy, pretty no, well-known weight cut guy. Mm -hmm. um, and George reiterated to the rest of the coaches that, yes, we do want her to gain a little bit more muscle so that the weight cut is a, is a lot easier because yeah. – muscle or water is held in the muscle not in fat so if we can increase her lean tissue it's going to be easily more easily done as far as the weight cut goes and you've seen you know when we started working with george we started working on more gaining solid muscle more functional muscle for the sport that the weight cut was a lot easier you yeah. know so i know i went on a rant right there but at the end <laughs> of the day what i'm saying is that don't be afraid to get stronger you know yeah. and do remember that it is going to increase other aspects of your game if yeah. you can get stronger. I always say this, when two fighters are technically and skillfully even, the X factor is going to be who's stronger. Yeah. And that's in all aspects of the game. Yeah. Do you think that the, the mentality of um, strength and conditioning within combat sport is changing a little bit so people are looking to be looking to be stronger because exactly as you said a lot of people don't want to get um bigger or you know go out, go out of a weight class do you think it's becoming a little bit more so working towards a little bit of strength and you know spending a little bit more time in the in in the weight room well you also have to remember that's you know when you get stronger when you when you are increasing force production when you are working the joints systematically you're increasing joint integrity you're increasing tissue strength, and, and, and then you're also reducing the risk of non-contact injuries that way. So you're going to have more longevity in the sport. So if you want to have a good, solid career, you're going to have to get in the gym, and you're going to have to lift external loads that are a little bit heavier than your body weight so that you can increase strength and increase joint integrity so that you don't get hurt or injured and that your performance can increase. Yeah. So when you're chatting there about, you know, getting in the gym and, and lifting heavier weights, just going on to sort of the, um, you mentioned a little bit about you have your guys for um, two, for two sessions, two, two days. How do you um, program training leading up to a fight and in, in between fights? What sort of the, um, the variables that take into account and structure training? Yeah, so my circumstances are a bit different than everybody else's. Remember that the American top team, we have well over 150 pro fighters all yeah. in the high level. I have 35 UFC fighters. I have 15 Bellator, and then the list goes on. Right now, I have 52 fighters that are starting camp up within the next couple of weeks. When they come to American Top Team, they usually are coming to the gym around eight weeks to six weeks out from their fight. So I only have them at that particular time if they don't live in Florida. Now, yeah. if they do live here, or if they are Dustin Poirier, Yuani and Jacek, or Essen Barbosa, or even Junior Dos Santos, I give them their GPP work. I give them their off-camp training so that when they get into camp, when yeah. they come back to Florida, they're ready to go. Yeah. Most of the time, though, however, I don't have that luxury with the people. One, because they don't have a gym that they can actually train properly, and they don't have a trainer or a coach that can run them through my particular program yeah so it's hard for them to do that especially if they're in like dagestan or chechnya or something like that they don't have the ability to get to a gym and do what i tell them to do yeah so a lot of the times we'll spend about two to three weeks at most working on general physical preparedness working on overall work capacity you know aerobic capacity to build up that foundation to build up that base so that once we get into camp, we're ready to go about eight weeks out. Now, when eight weeks out start, that's when I start running that conjugate method that I use. Um, like I said, it's a form of conjugate, and it's a form of concurrent training with the aerobic system. So two days a week, I have them in the weight room. Then that's not two days a week I'm only training them. You know, they also have to do their aerobic work outside of me. So yeah. I'll give them homework to do on, a, like for me, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays is their strength training days. But Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they're going to be doing some form of aerobic work or they're in with me on a Friday for a third day if they need to get some cleanup work or some rep work 
to help with restoration and recovery. And usually those are the guys that are out of camp or that aren't sparring or wrestling hard that week. So when it comes down to energy demands, we have to make sure we're correlating the skills practice around the weight training so that we're not overtaxing them um, and we're increasing that fatigue management so that they obviously can progress going further and they're not overtraining. So on a Monday, I'll just give you a quick, quick rundown of a week. So on Monday, they're doing a hard wrestling session. Now, this is like one and a half to two hours of hard wrestling, which is highly lactic, you know, and they're, they're, they're going nonstop, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a day we're going to be working primarily on aerobic capacity work or even aerobic power, depending on where they need to improve upon, right? After on a Tuesday, they're sparring. That's their sparring day in the afternoon. So if they are not in camp and they're not sparring, they're going to train with me in the afternoon while sparring is going on. That's going to be, like I said, that's going to be their max effort, strength, uh, max effort lower, upper body dynamic, mm-hmm. right? And then we're going to be doing some anaerobic alactic work in the conditioning portion of that day, right? The reason why I do anaerobic alactic because we're not throwing the organism in two different directions as opposed to if I were to do just some aerobic capacity work after their max effort training. It's just two yeah. different stimuluses. Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> Wednesday, I usually have let them, you know, take off or I'll have them do some mobility work, some low level mobility work or some cleanup like joint restoration work with high repetitions for very light weight. Yeah. And that's a small joint work. So that will be like extensions and hamstring curls and, uh, you know, just some, um, band pull apart things like that just to help with corrective exercise and then or whatever they need to do to clean up now thursday is another is another sparring day now if they do not spar that day again then they're going to come to me on the afternoon if they are sparring they're coming to me at night and then like i said they're going to be doing a max effort upper and a dynamic effort lower Mm -hmm. right so we're still not we're abiding by that 72 hour rule we're still getting a max effort day we're still getting a dynamic effort day twice a week and then they're going to do their anaerobic alactic or their what I call alactic speed endurance, which is basically repeated for an ability work or power yeah. endurance. On a Friday, like I said, if they're going to do a third day with me, usually that's like a cleanup day for their skills work. So they'll be doing like jujitsu or they're doing a grappling class in the morning or they'll do a boxing class in the afternoon. I usually run the Fridays at a right in between the grappling and the boxing. So that's going to be a repetition day. That's going to be more of like a aerobic capacity work, low level LSD work or escalating density training. And I have some protocols on my YouTube too, if you guys want to check that out. But basically what we're doing is we're just trying to get blood flow. We're trying to work on joint centration. We're trying to work on core stabilization. So we'd be working some FRC principles for mobility work, some low level isometrics, and maybe some, um, some sled pulls and drags just to get blood flow in the legs and the joints. Yeah. So uh, we've there obviously got two main two main days and a, th- and a third session if they're if if they're going to be around. Would you always or recommend um, for because sometimes when you speak to um, the people that are involved in in combat sports, they can train pretty reg- pretty regularly, whether it be working on on technique or sparring. Would you recommend um, just just two days and have a third optional day? What would what would you recommend? Yeah, I found that, you know, anything more, if they're, if they're high level or even if they're really training for a competitive, like a competitive fight, more than two days is going to be almost too physically taxing for them. Yeah. Especially if they're in competition, especially if they're in camp, right? If, they're, if they are, even if they are the regional, if they're in the regional scene all the way up to the UFC. Yeah. I just found that the over, you know, the overload of skills training and the, all the other tactical and technical training that they have to do on top of physical preparation, it's going to be too much overload. It's, it's, it's overcoming their maximum recoverable volume yeah. and you're going to end up overtraining them at that point. So three days is maximum for me, you know, from the years of doing this and playing around with it. Four days is just out of the question when you're talking about in camp fighters that are that are competitive that are actually fighting you know every other month or you know every three months or whatever the case yeah, yeah. 
So after obviously we've covered quite a range of quite a range of topics there from you know varying training um, to you know why mobility and movement so important and you know programming for to produce force and for combat for combat sports. Um, for everyone listening, what would be your take home points or words of words of wisdom just to just to wrap up? So for the coaches out there, I would say stay patient. I get a lot of questions asking me about you know, what it took for me to get where I'm at or whatever the case may be. And, and honestly, I still get humbled by that question just because I don't see that I'm at a place where, like, everybody needs to be at. I feel like I still have a lot to do and a lot to grow from. Um, but I would say just stay patient, be persistent each and every day, have a schedule in place so that you know what you're doing on a daily basis, and then make sure that you're taking that day and every hour in that day to progress, right, and to get better and to learn more and more. And from every experience to every book you read, you can always learn from something. When it comes down to, you know, athletes in general, again, stay patient, stay persistent, you know, make sure that you're managing out your fatigue, make sure you're getting plenty of rest and sleep and recovery, because it's not so much about, you know, what you can do, it's what you can recover from. And if you can train optimally rather than maximally, you're going to see more steadily progressions going further and longevity in your sport. Yeah, um, I think that was some great points to points to finish on. I know I've taken that from uh, you know as a coach myself, um, and you know in, in being involved in in lifting, uh, it's a topic that um, having the combat side of the gym that I work in being becoming becoming so popular. Um, I've took I've took a lot from that. Um, Thanks a lot for taking the time to chat with me. I hope everyone listening enjoyed that as much as as much as I did. Um, so, if anyone has any questions or wants to, obviously, you mentioned about your YouTube YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Where can people find you uh, and the content that you put out there? Yeah, so you can always find me on my Instagram. It's at Daru Strong. You can find me on my Twitter. It's the same handle at Daru Strong. And then you can check out my YouTube channel. I'm putting out new videos, probably three a week. And you just search Phil Daru and I'll be right there. So subscribe there and then hit me up on Instagram, DM me. I, I usually answer all the all the DMs I can. And that's about it, man. Oh, my website, DeruStrong.com too as well. You can check out all my programs and things like that there in my seminars. Yeah. That's it, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, over in the UK anytime soon? Uh, yeah, I'm actually coming out to Cumbria in okay. April. Yeah. Uh, I do have a I have, I have the banner um on my instagram so like i said if you guys want to know more about that just dm me and i'll send over the banner and all the information for the cumbria seminar in april yeah awesome um again thanks for taking the time to, to chat with me really good to um the the content you put out there um really benefits me benefits me as a coach and is interesting to read um i hope everyone enjoyed that and i will see you all next week all right